Welcome to the uh, uh, philosophy club meeting. Uh, there is a, a sign-up sheet going around on a blue clipboard, something over there. And if you would like to get emails of future philosophy club meetings, or you want to get extra credit, or what have you, go ahead and sign up. And uh, we'll send you an email for our uh, future philosophy club events. Uh, today, we're going to have kind of a panel discussion slash debate about the existence of God, uh, representing three different views. Uh, on uh, the uh, theist side, we have Father Bryce Sidley, who is here on campus at uh, Our Lady of Wisdom Church. <laughs> And we have Dr. Rick Swanson, who teaches sure. over in the uh, Department of Political Science. <laughs> and we have me, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Rick uh, Representing the atheist side, Dr. Swanson is presenting the agnostic side. Uh, so we're going to have this a little bit sort of organized. We're going to each do about 10 minutes of presentation, each do about 10 minutes of rebuttal. Uh, ask each other a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. Okay? Uh, so, why don't we go ahead then? What is it? Very good. I'll give you here and, uh, this arena. I'm representing it for the position. So I want to begin very briefly, though. Oh, he's uh, uh, a of titles. Sort of looking at the stage of the question, the reality is that 500 years ago, uh, the fact that theism would be a plurality, one of the beliefs that amongst the plurality of beliefs, is something that would be almost inconceivable. But yet now, at the beginning of the 21st century, the belief in God, theism, exists as one option amongst many. And so I think, in a certain sense, a very interesting question is how did we get here? How did things change so radically in the course of the past 500 years? And I think most people would say that besides cultural shifts, there was a very important philosophical shift. A distrust in the ability of our minds to know the truth and reality, and a loss of our understanding of metaphysics or causality, the things that lie beyond the physical realm. And so what I first want to really establish is that as a theist, I believe that the human mind has the ability to perceive and know reality with a great degree of certitude. Because of this, faith is not contrary to reason. We believe, as theists, that the world was created and that our minds were created and they match up with each other. That skepticism is not something that is a hermeneutic or a way that a theist normally looks at the world. Nor is a proper theist a fetist, where we believe in faith alone. Because that, like skepticism, basically despairs the ability of the intellect to know the truth. For uh, a theist, and for myself as a Christian, I believe that reason and faith can go together. That my faith is reasonable. Where there's mystery, I can explain it. Is it a struggle in the environment in which we live, where atheism and agnosticism tend to be prevalent? Yes, it is, but still it's a great chance to be able to have a dialogue like this to analyze and be reasonable about the subject. So there are many arguments for the existence of God. I'm going to present three arguments. Um, of course, we can get into a lot more. The first two are scientific, physical, and the third is more metaphysical. The first one is from an observation of the reality of the laws of nature is that we, using our reason, can discern regularity and symmetry in nature. There are laws that tend to govern the universe. Newton's first law of motion, the law of gravity, the laws of thermodynamics, etc. And these laws are precise, <coughs> mathematical, and more or less universal. In fact, the scientific method presupposes this. If everything was totally random, then we really couldn't do science. And so, we should be able to, I will argue, perceive or discern a creative, active mind behind these laws, a lawgiver. But these laws are not purely random. Einstein, who was not necessarily a Christian, said, everyone who is seriously interested in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of men, a mind, a spirit, something that 
puts the laws into the universe. Many other very intelligent individuals and scientists have held this view. Although it's typical to say that scientists are atheists, that's not always the case. Newton was a believer, Copernicus, Galileo, and many in our time, such as John Barrow, Polkenhorn, Roger Penrose, and Paul Davies. And so, are they all deluded? I mean, these are scientists who believe there's order and structure to the universe. I'll give you a quote from Davies to round up this argument, um, because he is one of the most preeminent of theist scientists. He said, science is based on the assumption that the universe is thoroughly rational and logical at all levels. Atheists claim that the laws exist reasonlessly and that the universe is ultimately absurd. As a scientist, I find this hard to accept. There must be an unchanging rational ground in which the logical, orderly nature of the universe is rooted. That would be God. So that's my first argument. The second argument is somewhat connected. It's the argument of fine-tuning. Now, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a physicist, but from what I have read and studied is that if the laws of nature, the laws that govern the universe, were even slightly different on the smallest level, things would be much different, that life as we know it would not have been able to come into existence. If the law of gravity had been a bit stronger, the universe would have expanded at a slightly smaller rate, the carbon production in stars would have been different, life could not evolve. Now, this is not necessarily a proof, as it were, of the existence of God, but the probability of all of these factors, I just named three, but I'm sure that if you talk to someone who knows a little bit more about this, they can name others, that that chance of all of these happening at the same time in order to produce life without any sort of guided reason behind it is infinitesimally <coughs> small. Imagine we're playing cards and that I have 10 straight flushes in a row. Is that possible? Is that probable? Well, it's possible, not so probable, but it can happen. But yet, if you saw that happen, you would say, wait a second, Father, you're cheating. They would see that. That would be an intuitive way. So if you look at all the chances that it brings about life, all these things that had to happen, it is very highly improbable uh, that there was not God behind it. Now, the scientists often bring up the idea of multiverses, that we just don't have one universe, but there are multiple universes. I think that that denies Occam's razor, that you're trying to multiply and add these other things to explain your position, when in general you should go with the simplest explanation possible. Now, as I said, these arguments are all scientific and help us to arrive at a certain concept of God. God is the creator. God is the one who puts laws in the universe. But this is not necessarily going to give us an adequate concept of God. It gives us more of that deist concept of God, the God who who sets the world in motion. And although I think probably for the terms of this debate, that's a legitimate concept of God, but I want to look at a more metaphysical argument to show why the existence of God is present or is necessary in the present. One that does not necessarily depend on science or even the creation of the universe at some particular time. And that is going to be, as my third argument, Aquinas' third argument, who gives five famous arguments for the existence of God. And it's the argument of causality, the argument of the first cause. We realize, using our reason and logic, that nothing created in this universe can cause itself. Whatever comes into existence must have a cause out of itself, outside of itself. I didn't create myself, that chair didn't create itself. There's always a cause outside of it, which shows that our existence, or existence in the universe, is what we call contingent, dependent upon some other cause. Well, if that's the case, then we can say the same thing must be true for creation or the universe as a whole. Therefore, we must logically posit a necessary being outside of the universe as a sustaining cause of the universe. This would be called God, the uncaused cause whose existence uh, is one with his nature, who is pure being, pure act, as the medievals would call it. We're not talking about, or at least I'm not talking about, what events in the past cause what exists here and now, but what keeps things in existence here and now, a causality that doesn't go sort of chronologically, but goes deep into existence, metaphysical, not physical. So imagine that I had a rock and I was pushing it with a stick 
Well, that rock can only be moving if I am constantly causing it to move. I remove my hand, I remove the stick, the rock stops moving. I'll let one of our contemporary Thomist philosophers, one who ascribes to the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, Dr. Edward Fazer, explain. He says, your mother gave you birth, but she is not, is what's sustaining you in being here and now. What's going to be doing that is something like the current state of the cells in your body, which is in turn sustained by what's going on at the molecular level and at the atomic level, along with gravitation, the weak and strong forces, and so forth. All of these things, being, all these things are being things whose essence is distinct from their existence and thus needs a cause outside of themselves. Meaning that all of these, we can trace it back, not in time, but if I'm existence, what causes me to be in existence? My cells, what causes that to be in existence? We have to go back to an uncaused cause. Logically, it demands that. I know it seems very difficult for people to understand, but this helps us to better grasp why existence is, is, exists as it does today. Two final things. One, and this is not so much an argument for the existence of God, but something I think is pretty interesting, is particularly if we say there's no God, and we believe in some sort of unguided evolution, what good does it have for us to survive to be able to perceive and appreciate beauty? And that we as humans, unlike animals and unlike inanimate objects, can perceive beauty. It's not evolutionary, ne evolutionarily necessary. And so I think the existence not only of things that are beautiful, but our perception of things that are beautiful has something to do with our intellects and the existence of God. But God is not only who is truly true, but also truly beautiful. And then finally, arguing as a Christian, I think we could also could discuss, and we need to discuss, the reality of the resurrection. Yes or no, as a historical fact, did Christ rise from the dead? If Christ rose from the dead, as scripture says, then what he said, and then what scripture teaches, and what traditional theism or Judeo-Christian, Judeo-Christian theism believes, should be something to be accepted. This is a different type of debate, but something I at least want to bring in the overall argument that they just look up. Thank you. somehow good that they do so. Moreover, most theists want to claim that God is not a wimpy being, that perhaps get beat up by other gods on occasion, right? He's all powerful. Uh, most theists want to claim that he's not a dumb God, that he's a very brilliant God, in fact, that he designed the universe and so forth. Now, there's a lot that can be said when it comes to understanding these various concepts in detail, but uh, I don't want to go too far into that. I want to allow for a wide range of conceptions of what it might mean to say that a being is perfectly good and uh, all-powerful and all-knowing. Okay? And those concepts can be per uh, uh, fairly sophisticated, too. So that conception of God, uh, uh, Father Sibley talked about a very common kind of argument for the existence of God known as uh, one variation of it, uh, known as the argument from design. And 
uh, variations of this argument come about uh, uh, pretty, on a pretty regular basis throughout the history of philosophy. You find very different developments of it. And the basic idea of the argument is to uh, look around the universe and the way it is, and then to conclude something about how the universe was created, or what it was created for, or why it continues to exist, and so forth. Okay? And somewhat similarly, one of the most famous arguments for atheism uh, uh, does a similar thing. It looks around at the universe and tries to draw a conclusion about uh, what sort of being might have created uh, such a universe, if any. Okay. And of course, what the atheist concludes is that, well, it's not the theistic God. And what the theist concludes is that, well, it is the theistic God. So to give you kind of a, an example here, this is an example I made up the other day. It's called the Big Tank. Okay. Uh, suppose on Fred's, Fred is the name I like to use in examples, suppose on Fred's daily walk, he notices that some sort of huge construction project is being started in his neighborhood. But he isn't sure exactly what they're building. As he goes by daily, construction proceeds quickly, but he still can't quite tell what this thing is supposed to be. Finally, one day, a sign is posted on the front of this thing stating that the project is finished and that people are welcome to come up and take a look at uh, what has been constructed. And right next to the sign are a set of stairs leading to the top, and Fred's very curious, so he heads on up the stairs, and he, once he reaches the top, sees that what has been built is a huge tank or vat, uh, maybe a hundred yards in diameter, and about three stories tall. And when he looks into the vat, he peers in and sees that it is filled to the brim with ant poison. And his friend wonders why someone would build such a thing in his neighborhood, particularly whether or not they had the right permits. He notices that a leaf has fallen into the tank. And on this leaf floating in the tank are a few ants. And he says to himself, oh, now I see what this thing is for. It was designed as an ant farm. How plausible is that inference? I guess not very. You're withholding judgment, fair enough. <laughs> uh, that seems pretty uh, implausible to me anyway. It seems like an implausible inference that this thing was built uh, as an ant farm, and in particular it was built by an incredibly good, capable designer as an ant farm. Okay? Why? Because in virtually all of it, ants would die immediately. Well, the universe is somewhat the same when it comes to life, human life. According to uh, this website called howitworks.com, which is pretty cool, uh, only about 0.000000000000000000000042% of the universe is made of matter. The rest is empty space. If any creature that we know humans and animals and such, were to wind up in empty space, it would not be good for them. Their blood would boil within a minute due to a lack of air pressure, after which they would freeze to death due to cold. Any creature out there would die within a minute. Even if you start looking at the matter that exists in the universe, the vast majority of it is highly inimical to life as we know it. People won't live well on a star on the surface of a star, it kind of tends to be warm there. Or uh, on a black hole, you'd be crushed to death, death instantly. Actually, it would take a little bit. You get stretched out and stuff. It's a school book by Neil deGrasse Tyson that explains it all in detail. Well, death by black hole. Um, 
the idea that this universe was somehow designed by an intelligent designer for life like ours seems no more plausible than the claim that the huge tank was designed as an ant farm, given that both are incredibly inimical to life. Okay. And so what we have here is kind of a, a variation uh, on the argument from design, and it points to the uh, apparent design that's there, and in this case says that if a creature designed this, they didn't design it for this purpose. And that suggests that it's not this kind of creature. A similar kind of argument from design looks at the evils, that certain kinds of evils that occur in the universe, and concludes on the basis of those that the universe was not designed by God. So for example, bad things happen in the world. I don't know, that is uncontroversial. Uh, some of these evils are natural evils, that is, they're not done by human creatures or other creatures with free will. Uh, there are natural disasters and accidents, such as earthquakes, floods, fires caused by lightning, being hit by lightning, etc., cause harm and suffering. Uh, threats from animals and insects, uh, diseases such as leprosy, cancer, pneumonia, schizophrenia, genetic defects such as blindness, deafness, children born without limbs, or born with severe deformities, and so forth. For the most part, humans don't cause these. I've never seen a human cause a tornado. Okay, cool to see. Uh, some good sometimes come out of these evils. Um, thousands or tens of thousands of people get injured in an earthquake, and other people have the good of saving them. But it'd be odd to say, boy, I'm glad we had that earthquake, because look at all the good that came out of it. Usually, we need to try to prevent the evil because there's so much more of it than we would prefer. An evil is said to be pointless, for the purposes of my argument, if either A, no good great enough to outweigh the bad comes out of it, or B, God could create that greater good without the evil. Okay. So a pointless evil is one that either no greater good comes out of it, or if there is a greater good, God could have gotten it without that evil. We certainly make judgments about these kinds of evils all the time. Uh, when people claim that, uh, when Pat Robertson claimed that the people of Haiti deserved to die in an earthquake because their ancestors 200 years ago made a deal with the devil, we can recognize he's a nut. Right? Amen. Yeah, we can even point out that uh, Haiti uh, has a larger portion of Christians in the United States. Um, so the argument basically is this. Given all of these evils, that as far as we can tell are both natural and pointless, it is very unlikely that a perfectly good being created this universe. That's all powerful and all knowing, because if he were perfectly good, he would desire not to have such evils. If he were all powerful, he would be able to prevent them. If he were all knowing, he would know how to prevent them. Consequently, they wouldn't exist. That's essentially the argument from evil, and that's my central argument.
And in any of these universes or dimensions or planes of existence, is there any life? Is there any intelligent life? Is there any very powerful and smart intelligent life? Is there any smart, powerful, and very good natured intelligent life? And if so, are they aware that we exist? Uh, do they watch us? Do they communicate with us? Do they offer us guidance? Do they interact with us? Do they rule over us? Did they create us? We don't know. And that's the point. Imagine that you have a, a pond way up on a mountain, surrounded by cliffs on all sides, and there's two frogs in this pond. All they know is this pond. They can't see behind the, the rock on all sides. And maybe they're familiar with a few amoebas and things and insects that they eat. And the two frogs are sitting there debating, and one frog says, you know, surely there must be a supremely powerful flying invisible frog that created us. Otherwise, how did we get here? And the other frog says, no, no, surely there can't be any such great supreme flying invisible frog because we would have seen it by now. There's no evidence of such. And they're debating, debating, debating. So while they're debating this, the planet that they're on is filled with millions of life forms outside of those mountain ranges of all kinds. Millions of life forms that are so diverse including millions or even billions of intelligent <coughs> life forms of all kinds of varying intelligences, strengths, personalities, and moral characters. And these frogs can't even conceive of what uh, these beings might be like. They can't even conceive of their existence. It is beyond the frog's imagination. And so that's sort of like our situation here on Earth. We're a bunch of frogs in a tiny pod trying to speculate about these things that are beyond our ability to conceive. Uh, and so now imagine the third frog comes up and listens to this debate and says, you know what, we have no idea what's beyond these mouths. We have no idea if there's a great flying frog, another flying frog, or any one of an infinite number of possible life forms or beings or whatever. We just don't know. Well, that's me. I'm that frog. That's the, that's the agnostic, which simply comes from the Greek A, meaning no, and gnosis, meaning knowledge. No knowledge. I don't claim to know. I don't claim to have any uh, solid arguments one way or the other. And I would actually say there are no solid arguments one way or the other. There's no solid evidence one way or the other. Life is a great mystery. And so as the debate is typically uh, set up in modern times between theism and atheism, the de they debate between, well, there's either this one supremely good, powerful, all-knowing being, or there isn't. When really there's an infinite number of possible beings or forces or supernatural realities that might exist. And so the debate is uh, way too narrow, incredibly too narrow, and it's uh, really the false choice of saying, well, either there's this one extreme or this other, when well, there's an infinite number of possibilities. And we just don't know. So there's all kinds of specific uh, counter arguments I could make to both Dr. Forsey and Father Sibley's argument. Uh, how much time do I have here? All right. Uh, anyway, I'll save that for uh, later. I just want to point out uh, another aspect of agnosticism because somebody might say, well, you've got to choose. You've got to choose. Your life hangs in the balance. Literally, your afterlife hangs in the balance. No, it doesn't. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, Pascal, and you have this weight, and Pascal said, well, you've got to believe in God otherwise, and you have nothing to lose, otherwise you might suffer infinite eternal hell. But Pascal failed to consider the fact that there are an infinite number of possible beings that might rule over the universe. They have an infinite number of possible laws. They might have an infinite number of possible natures, completely good to completely evil, or somewhere in between. And so you're going to have to pick between an infinite number of possible beings to believe in and worship. And it's sort of like uh, trying to guess the right lottery numbers when there's an infinite number of, of numbers to pick from. It's, it's pointless. You shouldn't even waste your time. And any money you invest your time trying to pick to win that lottery, it's just a waste of time. It's a waste of profit. But more importantly than that, Pascal's wager fails for another reason. A truly all good or just being is not going to punish people for sincere mistakes of not seeing that, that God or that particular being or beings exist. Yeah. It's sort of like, um, you know, if you can imagine the most evil being possible, uh, well, that most evil being would probably take other intelligent beings that are capable of feeling and suffering and subject them to just infinite eternal torment. Oh, wait, that's no. Wow. And so, uh, yeah, so the point is that what Pascal actually set up is that you should worship and believe in some, you know, satanical, tyrannical, ultimately sadistic being 
and choose to go with that, because if you don't, boy, they're going to take vengeance on you. But if there's any just, fair beings, you know, you might make some mistakes, but you're not going to go to hell for walking against the dull walk sign. Or, you know, you maybe hurt somebody's feelings sometimes. You don't deserve eternal hell. So either the being or beings, if there are any that rule in the afterlife, either they're just, in which case, as long as we do just, you know, make some mistakes but generally good lives, we can trust that the beings are going to treat us well in the afterlife. And if uh, they're unjust beings, well, there's nothing we can do. If it's Hitler ruling the afterlife, it doesn't matter how good or bad we try to do. It's going to be uh, tyranny and sadism, and so there's nothing we can do. In either case, there's nothing we can do but just live the best life we can. And so well, let's hope that the beings in the afterlife are actually good and just, and not have scale of satanical, uh, tyrannical tyrants who are ruling the afterlife. So to me, agnosticism is the most logical, rational approach to the wonder of existence. So my philosophy can be summed up as follows. What's in the great mystery box of existence? We have no idea. Life is a profound but unanswerable mystery. So all we can do is live the best life we can, create and share as much joy and beauty and meaning as we can. And I have a counter argument later, which I'll give. Uh, that beauty can be found without any uh, supernatural reality or depending on what it is. And then we should savor every precious moment of life all again. So thank you. Even the worst seemingly pointless evil has some meaning when put in the perspective of eternity. You see the book of Maccabees in the Old Testament, where the people are suffering and they come to have an understanding that suffering has to have a reason because, therefore, there must be some form of resurrection or redemption in the next life. 
But if you don't believe in an afterlife, then indeed, this point makes some sense that suffering really seems to be inexplicable. My third point is an argument from analogy. We can use analogy to say that God and man are good. We can't forget that there's a major dissimilitude. That when God is good and we're good, we can say that, but God's goodness is so radically different than our goodness. What God sees as good may be quite different than what we perceive as good, although some of it certainly comes to be the same. Dr. Clark sees again of imposing his limited conception of good on God. You know, C.S. Lewis makes the argument that if, if God was exactly as Dr. Carsey described him, then we would think that maybe we created this concept of God. But it would be too easy. God would be created in the image and likeness of man. For a Christian, the incarnation, the crucifixion, and resurrection are the last thing that we expect, that God would become one of us and die. And so it makes us doubt that we would come up with such a concept of God. My next argument is that natural evil ultimately is the result of moral evil from a theist perspective. If God is good, then he does not create the evil, but permits it, because he's given us free will. And that human moral evil somehow creates a disturbance in the universe, allowing for these other evils. You might use chaos theory to explain this, and somehow the butterfly here causes an earthquake in Japan. Why does God permit it? Well, like a parent who lets his child live with the result of his choices. Not stopping the child from doing it, but allowing the child to live with the results of his choices. One of the results of the choices of mankind is bringing about this evil in the world. Next, has there been a significant uptake in atheism after natural disasters, such as the Haiti earthquake, or in the most poor, miserable areas of the world it would be like this ant farm? The exact opposite is true. The faith is still very strong there. The only people questioning are college professors sitting in their air conditioner offices eating quinoa and listening to NPR. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're not one of them, obviously. <laughs> Number six, compare the problem of evil to theist proofs. God is a logical necessity. Think of the proofs that I've given, I can give a number of other ones. That we cannot believe existence is, or that we are sustained existence without some first cause. So, if we accept that, and we accept there's evil, there's got to be some reasonable explanation for this evil. So the, the, the problem of evil, of existence, does not negate the other proofs that we can give logically for God's existence. And so <coughs> he, he brings up, Dr. Parksy also brings up a number of different issues <coughs> about the, the argument from design. Again, I'm not really arguing from design in the physical sense. I'm arguing design for the metaphysical sense, the reality, the causality that keeps us in existence, that we have to have something that maintains our existence because our being is contingent, because we, we are not, we cannot bring ourselves or keep ourselves in existence, at least in a metaphysical way. You can also sort of cross apply most of my arguments to this whole analogy or this whole description of this big fact. The reality is, is that how do we know? How do we know that God would not do that? He's claiming some certainty. It is quite possible that God in his infinite design, as we talked about, allows for the fine tuning of the universe to say there is some reason for existence to exist just in this small part of the universe, or at least as we know it. To go and look at what Dr. Swanson said, I'll try to give back time. Okay, I'll try to give five to guardians. There are many things, and this is my substantial one, many things in the world that we do not have a substantial evidence for, but we still believe. Other minds, this is a big problem for Descartes. The love of a friend, how do I know my friend really loves me? He could be manipulating me. Our perception of reality, you know? Davros could be deceiving us so that he could send the Daleks to destroy us. Who knows? <laughs> we have no idea about that. But yet, we still believe, at least on a practical level. We don't go around and say, I can't know anything, because everything's a mystery box. If we're going to be agnostic, we have got to be categorical in our agnosticism, not just saying, well, I can't know anything God, but I can know everything else. If we're going to despair the intellect, we have to despair the intellect across the board. He brings up the question of unicorns and these fanciful beings. Well, we have no proof, as he said, either way that they exist. So then should we be agnostic about that? Is it wrong to claim, as most people do, that unicorns don't exist? Because we don't have proof either way. 
it's possible we can think of the essence of a unicorn. We may not have seen the existence, but should we be agnostic about other things? Is it possible that unicorns could exist? Third, I think that the agnosticism argument is ultimately self-refuting. How can you be sure of your own theory, which is not something physical, that you can't be sure of when you can't be sure of that which lies beyond scientific proof and physical existence? Yours is a non-material theory. Shouldn't an agnostic be agnostic about his agnosticism? Since you yourself can't be certain that anything exists, how do you even know that the thoughts in your mind are really there? Because you can't ultimately prove it. Since you have no proof again, cross-applying what I said to Dr. Parksey, that your cognitive faculties are harder to are capable of knowing the truth, how do you know anything? Shouldn't we just go through our lives mindless? Why do we even bother studying? We should be agnostic about everything. So ultimately, this comes down to an issue of epistemology and metaphysics. And if I can leave you with any point, this is what's crucial. For a theist, we believe that we can have intellectual certainty. We're going to be wrong sometimes, but that we believe in the world being created, our minds were created, even though it may be through a process of evolution, to match up with the reality outside of us. There's no room for real skepticism or agnosticism. There's some things we may not know. We believe that the reason can come to know certain things both a priori and through induction and to have a reasonable certitude. And finally, bringing up Pascal's wager. Again, I think that this is something that is very applicable. And the fact that the God question, more than whether or not Coke is better than Pepsi or Domino's is better than Papa John's, is a very, very important question that we simply can't sit back and be agnostic about. And this categorization of Pascal's wager, somehow you're going to go to hell if you make a mistake, that's a straw man argument. In no way, shape, or form did Pascal believe that. In no way, shape, or form do I, as a Catholic Christian, believe that. God knows the heart. Certain moral laws, yes, even though we're not really getting into them that much in this debate. But this is a straw man argument to say that, that God is ultimately going to send someone to hell and in a certain sense, it's also a red herring. It gets away from what we are trying to talk about is the ability of the intellect to know metaphysical reality and whether or not causality, metaphysics, spiritual things really do exist. I've told Dr. Carson this before. This is the real debate. And this is the thing that really should have a discussion about. But if we sit around and discuss causality and metaphysics, there'd be five people in here plus us three. It's not something that's very engaging. But again, it's about the worldview, whether or not our human intellect has the capability of knowing the truth with any degree of certainty, and if things that do the lot but lie beyond the physical realm, uh, such as that would be metaphysical, causality, purpose in the world, do exist and whether we can know them or not. Thank you. Of the odds 
uh, certain events occurring. And in order to say that the odds are trillions to, uh, you know, the odds of having this uh, particular set of laws of nature are really low because if you change one of them just slightly, uh, life wouldn't exist. Well, the options, though, are limited to changing one factor in all the laws of nature just slightly. You can change all the laws of nature that you want. Uh, and uh, if you're a god, right, or even if you're talking about a random creation of the universe, there's an infinite number of possibilities there as to what the laws of nature might be. Consequently, there's an infinite number of possible different systems of laws of nature that would support life as we know it. The mere fact that one set is unlikely given uh, that everything else remains the same just represents the odds of getting a particular kind of universe. Uh, second, even if uh, you had to explain why uh, the universe had the laws it had, again, there's no reason to believe that it was God that would create this universe. In fact, as I argued, uh, it's very unlikely that God would create this universe uh, as uh, something that supports human life. Uh, notice that there's the same inferences here about what God would want, God's intentions, and God's resulting actions that are made in the problem of evil. Here they seem to be okay, there they seem to be wildly unrealistic. That view seems to me to be inconsistent. I'll come back to that. Aquinas' first cause argument. Uh, first of all, uh, the evidence that nothing in the universe can cause itself uh, presupposes that we're talking about things inside the universe and that those things can be applied to events outside the universe. That isn't known. It's not known what, if anything, happens outside the universe, consequently to apply what we know inside the universe uh, to causal effects outside the universe may be an illegitimate move. Okay? Uh, in other words, merely because things inside the universe in our experience can't cause themselves, it doesn't follow that things outside the universe can't cause themselves. Second, it's not clear why anything needs to sustain the universe, why it can't just continue on as it does, much the same way physical objects in motion do. Aquinas thought they needed sustaining causes, Newton certainly didn't, and that's a very uh, much more plausible kind of view. Uh, third, if necessary, uh, if the ultimate cause of the universe is necessary, then what it causes is necessary, which means there aren't any contingent events in the universe. Uh, consequently, you have no explanation of contingent events in the universe by appealing to a necessary being. Finally, there's no reason given why the causes could not go back infinitely in principle, uh, perhaps to something going on prior to the existence of the universe. Um, why can we appreciate beauty? Uh, well, not everything has to have an evolutionary explanation, even if you're an evolutionary biologist. We have an ability to chew gum. It doesn't follow that we evolve so that we can chew gum. Right? This is just to misrepresent an evolutionary position. Uh, Rick talks about a variety of possible different uh, beings uh, that could exist and that we have no knowledge of. Uh, my inclination is to think that, yeah, there's an infinite number of possible beings out there. In our uh, best experience, uh, the number of actual beings is a very small percentage of the number of possible beings. Therefore, probably these other possible beings don't exist. Uh, in some cases, you're likely to be wrong, but it seems like a reasonable inductive inference. Uh, going back to Thomas uh, Sibley's rebuttal to the argument from evil, many of them he had seven replies, many of them really being repetitions of each other. Uh, the first couple are getting at the point that uh, God could have, or several of them are getting at the point that, well, God could have reasons for what appear to us to be evils uh, that show that they're really not evils at all, okay? And that someone would have to be omniscient in order to know what God's intentions were. Well, first of all, I don't think this requires omniscience any more than the fine-tuning argument requires omniscience. Um, but aside from that, I mean, uh, <coughs> suppose it really were the case that every evil that happened was for the best, and uh, uh, it was uh, God's will that it occurred. Should we then not try to stop evils? Should we then try to create similar evils? Right? I mean, if God really wanted this hurricane uh, to wipe out 100,000 people, um, why should we go try to rescue the remaining 50,000? Maybe he wants them wiped out too. We can't know. God could have reasons we don't know. So when do we try to stop evils, or do we? Or do we just say, hey, God's will, you're tough luck. Right? Why have doctors in medicine? 
why not just, hey, and this was of you for, uh, at one time, right? God's will, if you're, you're uh, sick and dying, why should we try to come up with a cure for you and undermine God's will, right? My point is that we've got to make common sense moral decisions about what we do in the world and how we interact with the world. That's the standard of evidence for saying whether or not a being that's really perfectly good would create all kinds of things that to us appear to be pointless evils, when in fact they're not. He's keeping that a secret from us. Yet he wants us to make good moral decisions. He wants us, he gave us free will, so that we can be held morally responsible for what we do, but he's going to keep from us the moral knowledge we need to use that free will to make moral decisions. Because he could have all kinds of reasons that we're not aware of. I think that's a very impossible kind of picture. I think it's an inconsistent picture to, on the one hand, say we've got good reason to believe that God is good, that when people uh, go into a uh, Burger King and kill 50 people with their AK-47 because they say God wants them to, that God didn't really want them to. If Father Sibley is correct, we've got no reason for thinking God didn't want them to. Why punish them? I think if we, uh, well, so what's an example perhaps of a pointless evil? Well, most famous example, suppose there is a bolt of lightning strikes in an isolated area and uh, 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 causes a forest fire. And there are no people around. Bob gets caught in the forest fire, does not die immediately, but gets burned terribly, 90, uh, you know, third degree burns over 90% of its body, lays there dying in agony for weeks before being eaten by maggots a lot. What good is there that comes out of this that God couldn't figure out a way to get without all that suffering? I don't think it's plausible to believe that there is one. I think that's very improbable. That doesn't involve omniscience. That's just taking what the theist says about God, that he's good, that he's powerful, that he has knowledge, and saying, look, if you have all of that, you probably wouldn't do this in either this or a billion other cases that we might talk about where these sorts of harms have occurred. And again, if we really believe that these things are for the best, we shouldn't try to stop them. We should be glad they occur and celebrate all the suffering. Because after all, it's really for the best. And God just can't figure out a way to get this good without this evil. Um, another uh, uh, response, well, maybe God's conception of good is radically different from our conception of the good. Well, maybe so. But then how do we know if we're doing something that's good? We think it's good. Maybe God doesn't. Maybe we think it's good to help people that are dying or suffering from a tornado uh, impact. Uh, maybe we're completely wrong. Maybe we're doing terrible evil. If Father Sibley is right, we have no way of telling. And I think that he was so divorced from our common sense views of what we ought to do that eventually what, essentially what Father Sibley is suggesting is a kind of moral skepticism. We can't have any more knowledge. We can't know what's right or wrong because we can't know the mind of God. And I believe that instead we have an obligation to make the best, best moral judgments we can, and those indicate that there are unnecessary evils. Um, uh, another response was that, uh, well, perhaps humans are the response, uh, are the cause of all the natural evils, the kind of Adam and Eve story. Well, that's kind of like blaming the ants um, for being in the uh, uh, vat. Uh, it seems very unlikely that at just one point in time, God gave one or two humans the power to completely destroy a perfect universe and then never did it again, and then blamed all his descendants for doing it. I think that's a very impossible kind of moral view, right? It holds people responsible for things that they have no responsibility for. It wouldn't unjustly limit people's free will to keep them from destroying the universe. We don't have the power to destroy the universe. We don't have the power to change the laws of nature, but nonetheless we have free will. And if we can have it, then so could it have our ancestors. Free will doesn't mean freedom to do absolutely anything you can think of. Uh, oh, uh, uh, sixth reply, if, not, if cognitive forces are the result of chance, 
uh, if they evolved. Uh, so we've got no reason to trust the analytic. Well, first of all, evolution doesn't say anything evolves by chance. Uh, second, uh, no reasonable uh, uh, defender of the theory of evolution is going to try to claim that everything that exists, every human feature that we have, is the result of evolution. Uh, our ability to choose gum is an example. Uh, we tend to get byproducts uh, from various things, and the efficiency uh, that you get from, say, being able to see uh, all kinds of things rather than just being able to see predators suggests that we're going to have abilities that go beyond the very narrow ones required by natural selection. So there you go. That's right. Bye. The argument that physical laws of the universe indicate uh, there must be designers. 
Well, if that analogy is true, that we can look at the design of the universe and then draw conclusions about the designer of the universe, everything that's been designed by humans is that about, and the more complex the item is that's designed, means it was designed by a team of designers, not an individual. And in fact, since every designer that we see of, of human inventions is both uh, technically imperfect, because their inventions are perfect, and morally imperfect, then by analogy, whoever designed the universe, if we look at things like birth defects, we say, well, the universe must have been designed by a team of designers who are technically and or morally imperfect. Now, so if that analogy holds, you can draw inferences from the design of the universe, then that analogy would be a team of designers technically and morally imperfect. Uh, he says that the perception of beauty indicates there must be some God or metaphysical reality that evolution could not give a rise to this. Quite the contrary. Uh, evolutionary psychologists have done lots of studies. And around the planet, in all cultures, people think a picture of a park like area, sunny trees, grassy areas by a lake or, or a river or a creek, People universally say, wow, that looks pretty. A uh, picture of a spider, no, does not look pretty. <laughs> Why? Because spiders are threatening from an evolutionary basis, and a park like area by a water supply is a great place to live and survive. So even evolutionary psychology has been able to explain our perception of beauty and ugliness. Uh, and also, uh, Father Sidney says that, um, uh, he actually responds to Keith's argument about the problem of evil. Father Sidney says, well, you know, God is so supremely good beyond our perception of good. But then that's self refuting to his own theism, uh, his own version of it. Because his own, you know, the Christian Bible says we're formed in God's image and we're given this moral conscience. In which case, if we really can't go by our moral conscience at all, well, then we should completely disregard anything in the Bible or any sense of our moral conscience. But then we are able to say, yeah, we have these feelings of good and evil, we have this sense of right and wrong. And so uh, we are able to say there is certain things that are evil and suffering, and we cannot conceive of an all-good being that would allow this to happen. You know, if we as human beings, of our moral sense, says it would be very wrong, and if we, we had had the power to stop, let's say, mass butchering of, of children and infants with machetes in Rwanda a couple decades ago, wouldn't we have done it? And why did the Supreme Being do it? It's a very powerful argument that I think Father Sidney dismisses way too easily because the problem with people is a very, very important argument. But it's only an argument against a perfectly all good and perfectly all powerful being. There may be supremely good beings that are the divine equivalent of a Gandhi or Mother Teresa, but that aren't perfect and make mistakes sometimes. Or maybe they aren't perfectly powerful. Uh, and so the problem of evil is only an argument against an all-powerful and perfectly good being. So they're each half that. And I guess I'll go ahead and leave it for this. I know we have a lot of uh, probably other arguments we want to go back and forth on the question. But uh, basically, just use your common sense judgment. If, there's, if you don't have any solid evidence either way, then the common sense view, like the box. They both said, you know, we don't have any perception of what's in the box, therefore the reasonable, principled, common sense thing is to say, we don't know what's in the box. Thanks. So, that, so now we're going to eat, uh, probably each ask each other a question or two, and then we'll open it up for a uh, have a little discussion that we'll go next. For clarification, Dr. Arts, my question is this. I mean, looking at the argument from me, I'm trying to understand the problem. Does, does your argument, or does that argument necessitate if God doesn't exist? Or is it possible, as Dr. Swanton would say, that a non good God could exist, some sort of an evil, omnipotent um, being? Is that a possibility? So is it a defeater for the belief in the existence of God, or simply a defeater for the what we're going to do it amongst each other, then we'll open up the guys. Yeah, I mean, the problem with evil is only going to be uh, a problem for a being that is uh, 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 perfectly good 
uh, uh, all-powerful, all-knowing in some sense. It's of no use against a creature like Zeus, right? Uh, it doesn't do anything at all. And so it's uh, dealing with kind of that classical conception of God, but that is the standard theistic conception of God, the Roman Catholic tradition and Protestant traditions, Islam, Judaism, and so on. But yeah, uh, uh, if, if you want to talk about a God that is not like that, then the problem of evil isn't going to do anything at all. So do you think it's possible that then, from that argument, God like that doesn't exist? Is maybe fishing malevolent or some capricious uh, like God? Oh, like a person like yeah. uh, Could there be? Uh, well, <coughs> how do you jump to atheism yeah. and not to I believe in Zeus or some capricious video? Oh, yeah, uh, the word uh, uh, atheism is a little bit ambiguous. Uh, sometimes, in, in what's sometimes called atheism in the narrow sense, it's used as a label for the view that the theistic God does not exist. Uh, that's the sense uh, uh, in which it leads straight to atheism, right? Uh, there's a broad sense of atheism which holds that uh, no gods exist, right? Um, uh, to support that view is uh, a little bit different. I mean, uh, obviously there's an infinite number of possible conceptions of God. You would take out some of the most more popular ones by the problem of evil, right? The theist conception. And then for other gods, you'd have to have some other kind of argument. Uh, which might be something like, well, I don't see any good reason to suppose that these beings exist. I don't see any evidence of them. Uh, if they did exist uh, and they were relevant to me, probably I would see some evidence, and so maybe not so much. Then it's possible to come back and say, well, you know, maybe these guys don't want us to know they exist or whatever. I guess that's a possibility as long as the conception of the beauty that you have is logically consistent. So you would be atheistic against the traditional theistic concept of God yeah. and agnostic versus these other concepts of God? Uh, possibly some of them, yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't in fact, uh, uh, yeah, I guess it would be agnostic. I don't believe that any of these other gods exist. Uh, for some of them that people have talked about, I think there are good reasons for thinking those gods don't exist. For other ones, I would just say I don't believe uh, that I've never heard of. I don't believe or disbelieve. I, I don't have the concept of them. Okay. Well, that's, that's the question I have. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, at some point, it becomes unclear as to whether or not you've got a god anymore, too, or just a part of the space. Yeah, right? correct. You know, yeah. Like that. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Boy, he's in trouble. He is trouble. He's in trouble. He's everything. So, anyhow, so Dr. Swanson, my question, I guess, for you is when you say solid evidence for belief in something, what constitutes or what criteria do you offer for you at least, or do you think would be applicable to everybody that would constitute solid evidence to believe? Well, certainly, you know, something like solid evidence is understandably a very vague term, and no matter how any of us define it, you know, you have to define evidence, you define it, but the terms themselves would be vague, but the right variety of instances. But it's got to be at least some regular, consistent perception. A regular a perception, but that is regular and is consistent. That is perhaps verified by other people, uh, and that there is no strong counter argument the other way, and there's no alternative explanation for that perception. Uh, no very plausible, reasonable alternative explanation for that perception. But even that, I admit, has not been perfect because, uh, yeah, there, I can imagine there's all kinds of situations. Okay, I, I hate to be the one bring it up, but you know, what about what if we live in the matrix? Yeah. That we're all being deceived by the architect. What if what if what if what if we can't know for certain? Well yeah, I mean none of us can uh, say for certain that's the case or not. It's impossible we are living there. Sure. So are you are you agnostic about us living in the matrix? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. But none of us that's the point. So then so you have an agnosticism towards the matrix. But you say absolutely I guess I would say that. Okay. And now, <laughs> I guess the question would be why? What's your evidence? Yeah. Well, the thing is, is, again, that's what I think that my question really comes down to is what are the criteria for evidence? You're not going to accept metaphysical evidence. You're not going to accept metaphysical evidence. Or, I'm not sure what you mean by metaphysical evidence. Well, causality, or well, let's leave it here, evidence that lies beyond what is, well, evidence what is, that lies beyond what is empirically verifiable through the scientific method. Uh, I think there, there is. Know, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he said he wouldn't. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a more important question. Because ultimately it doesn't matter if we're correct about this being this reality or it doesn't matter. Because there's nothing we can do about it. 
right? There's nothing we can do about it. And so that goes back to my point. You follow up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, whatever, if there are any beings or beings, uh, different levels of existence, whatever that rule us to do, again, all we can do is say, well, just, you know, we can try to do the best we can. But wouldn't that agnosticism make us agnostic in about our ability to perceive reality? Well, I mean, look, when I get into a very subtle question of epistemology, but... That's what it's all about. Yeah, and, and that's, but the, yeah, we can't say, you know, can I say, can any of us say for absolutely certain that what we're perceiving is reality? No, one of us, the three of us, we might be locked up in mental right now perceiving all of it, and whole movie's based on <laughs> But I have no choice but to go based on the reality that I can perceive, especially when it's consistent <coughs> regular, and at least I perceive what I, I think, and I perceive the other minds, and they verify, and they say the same thing, and that's pretty sure. But I'm not, but I have to live the life based on what I perceive. Because we all, we always have to live the lives based on what we perceive. So, so finally, I mean, so from the lot of that, so let's say that I perceive the hand of a deity in the world, um, either through looking at causality, looking at uh, design or whatever, then would Jewish agnostics say that it's okay for me to be a theist because I perceive order in the world and you can't be sure that I'm right or wrong? Would it be okay for me to be a theist? What I would say is it would be okay for you to say you perceive something that exists in the world, mm -hmm. but then it's a hugely good view, and okay. a huge unfounded view. Okay. And for example, both the physical and metaphysical arguments you make, even if they work, and let's say they do, you can maybe argue there seems to be something beyond the physical universe, but it could be any one of an infinite number. And so then if you said, I'm not going to take a position on which particular being or being of force that exists, there seems to be something of a big sense of something. I was okay. I so it ultimately comes down to yeah. the problem of evil. We can't say a good God exists, but something may exist out there. But not even uh, anything like an all-powerful being. Or, but again, it might, be, it might be, well, it might be teased. You know, there are religions that say we're in this level of Seems existence it. and there are a <coughs> number of gods at the next level and you go up to higher. That could be possible then. Anything could be possible. Okay. That's the thing. <coughs> Possible. In fact, I would probably argue that if we do survive this life and go into the natural life, it's probably like nothing any of us conceived of anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Paul said. Yeah. And so, <laughs> <laughs> Serpent God who demands you to sacrifice. All right, fair enough. I mean, and I would agree with you. Correct. Yeah, and I would agree. With you. And so, and you would say it would be unjust of what the father to punish you for being sincerely mistaken about it. Um, but are we presuming that he would punish me and send me to hell? Yeah. Or just any time. Well, I mean, if he, if Quetzalcoatl is the one dictating the terms of the universe, and I think this is also gets down to the, the big thing of how do we conceive of God's freedom, how do we conceive of God's intellect? I mean, what, by what standard are we establishing? So, so he's going to damn me? I guess if he's going to damn me because I didn't believe in him, would I, with my current perception of things being unjust, I would think he's unjust. If he did not look into my mind and heart with his his serpentine in, into that intelligence <laughs> to be able to read that I was thinking, I would think that would be unjust. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. How, do you know you're, you, how do you know you're not the matrix? Uh, well, because, I, again, <laughs> I will, as a theist, now, I have two reasons. As a theist, faith comes into, there's natural theology, where I think it is, I can perceive or believe that indeed there's a part of the universe that uh, my being is contingent. I go into one of 20 different arguments in different ways that, that, that God becomes a logical necessity. Now what kind of God, at least some creator God is a logical necessity, okay. um, that, that my intellect, how it came to being, is going to match up with reality. Okay. I can know certain things for certain. Okay. I do believe that. Okay. I'm not in any way skeptical from a skeptic. Oh, there's certain things about God that I may not be able to know for certain. Yes, that's why we, we as Christians at least believe in some form of revelation. Yeah. And so as I think we mentioned before, 
is there going, do I have the same type of scientific certitude that I believe this table is here, this, this empirical certitude, the table is here, uh, that I do about God's existence? No, it's different. You can't have that. I think we're looking at two different sets of evidence. Um, could I sit here and question whether or not I am in the matrix? I mean, yes, one possibly could, but I do not approach reality from the, the, the stance of skepticism. I'm a firm believer in the intellect who has no reality and, and, and that, that reality exists that I'm not having yeah. some yeah. little trick play on. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, nobody believes we're in the matrix, right? Uh, the, the difficult part is proving it. And that's what I was just, what's, what's, what's the, do you have a proof? Well, that, that, that can't possibly happen. But that's the thing is, is it goes back, and then this is sort of goes back to what I said about the difference about is, what sort of standard of evidence are we looking for? I mean, what will you accept? What will you accept? Well, I'll accept, I'll accept causality. I'll accept contingency. I'll accept the third cause, when in a sense, maybe you well, maybe won't, because there are certain standards of evidence. So that's where I think uh, the idea of worldview or these, <coughs> these meta questions of epistemology, of metaphysics, of evidence, have got to be discussed with the area, because we have different standards. Okay. Um, well, yeah. Uh, Still not seeing what the answer is, but we're really not going to ask anyone, right? Which is, I mean, there is this question that's difficult to answer about what sorts of evidence would a person accept to hold a particular view about, say, atheism or atheism or agnosticism. Uh, how good does the evidence have to be for you to uh, retain your current view or change it to some other view, right? And and of course that's that's a very difficult. Uh, um, uh, question to answer. Uh, I'd say from uh, uh, I guess I a question here part. Uh, the answer that uh, is assumed in the problem of evil is common. The, the level of evidence required would be that level of evidence required to make common sense moral judgments, and that that strength of evidence. Uh, whatever it might be, is good enough to make a judgment about whether or not God exists. And so I guess my question would be, uh, why isn't that enough evidence to, uh, in principle, if, if it commonsensically, you know, there's uh, evils that appear to us to be pointless, why isn't that standard of evidence sufficient to make a judgment? Especially given that uh, we're kind of forced into making common sense moral judgments. Mm -hmm. And the common sense moral judgments that we ordinarily we make, uh, that we ordinarily make, are pretty important, right? And, and so is the, and in fact, you could argue that uh, whether or not we should believe in God is a part uh, of moral judgment, right? Uh, at least it has moral implications. So is, is that not a sufficient standard of evidence to make a judgment there? Well, I think it goes back to my final point of too, is that let's say that we take this as a, whatever standard we're going to use with their evidence is valid. The problem with evil makes us call into question the existence of God. Well, I don't think that negates the other arguments that I made, particularly the argument of the contingency of the universe, that I still have to wrestle with that. But that would have to be disproven for me. Okay. Because I can say, like, I'm a, I, I'm, I exist, I'm a contingent being, you know. How am I being sustained in my existence? Or you know, when I even get into sort of an argument of, of how did the universe, how did something come from nothing? That argument of the problem of evil is not necessarily, for me at least, a defeater against the fact that a uncaused cause or an unmoved mover is logically necessary for existence. So what I would do, well, as I said, I'd accept that, and then I'd say, well, somehow I've got to reconcile evil because if I throw out God, then, then causality and all these different types of things don't exist in it. Why are, where do we come from? Yeah. Um, Why are we here? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would, uh, uh, why accept the uh, argument of contingency rather than the problem of evil? Rather than accept the problem of evil, right, and leaving the problem of contingency as a possible? Because I don't think, that, as, as I said, I don't think the, the problem of evil logically necessitates atheism. And your position, it, one could say it logically potentially necessitates a good God and you understand God, but it doesn't logically say that God doesn't exist. Where the problem of contingency, either there's a necessary being or there's not a necessary being. It's an either or. They're not possible, they're options. Yes, they are. 
But again, which is hard because you don't accept metaphysics. No, no, I just, what, well, you, you're, yeah, I don't want to say distorting what I'm saying, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, yes, clearly, at some point, you have to say that there's something that just is. Something that just is. But you're then making the leap saying it must be intelligent mind, when it could just easily be just that all existence just is. It's just, is it the universe just exists? Uh, but, then how does it, just, how, how, does, how does the universe then, First of all, come into being, and how does it just exist? Does it need something to sustain it in being? That's the mystery box. How or, can uh, 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 it exist? Uh, 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 <laughs> or it just, it just exists necessarily. It's 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 Why not bring the necessary step up one more how step? Can, how can contingent yeah. existence exist necessarily? That's a lot of contradiction. Uh, well, then, if God is necessary, he's supposed to cause contingent things. Whatever he causes is going to be necessary. You have the same problem. No, it's not necessary because we cannot exist. Because we're contingent. Yeah, we're so contingent, right? Not but not if God is a necessary thing. But see, this is but and what he causes is necessary. And I didn't say what he causes is necessary. I say he but causes a necessary being. He is a necessary being. Okay. What he creates is not necessary. Then it would be So what he creates is contingent. So his decision to create is contingent. His decision his decision to create is contingent. Absolutely. Nothing okay. necessitates it. So contingent. what explains that contingent to bed? God's free will is freedom. Okay. And what explains his having freedom? Uh, the fact that he uh, was a personal God. I, mean, you, I see what you're saying. You're, they're, 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 at least from the sort of mentality and the standards of evidence and the standards of physics that I'm establishing, that you're going to have, and of course I'm sort of basically arguing that Mr. Garrison couldn't have uh, for precepts, if you're going to have to get back to a being, that is but necessary. Not, yeah. You have to get back to something that is not contingent. But then you're making that leap to say but, it must be intelligent. But that, that something, that something exists. Yeah, but isn't it? And it has to be, it has to be. Yes, but it doesn't have to be a mind. At this point, you make that uncommon leap by arbitrarily just saying it must be a mind. So it doesn't have to be. So how could something which does not have intelligence and which have a mind bring things into existence? It's not. It well, just exists. It just exists. It's a profound mystery. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> look at, look at uh, bees and beehives, right? The bees aren't particularly intelligent, 
but they create something that appears very ordered, uh, uh, very functional, right? Uh, maybe uh, you've got more than one universe creator in there, like the beast, they create universes, and this is just what they do. Or maybe the being that created the universe is a horribly evil being with very limited power, and all it can do is create the universe. And maybe it has nothing to do with the being described in the Bible and so forth. I mean, that's, I think that's the point Rick is getting at, just from the claim that you have to have a necessary being, it doesn't fall that it's God. And I think that this is not really certain, I'm indirectly answering your question, it goes back to my first exact point. And, 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 and over the past, course of the past year or so, I've been reading a lot of thoughts to Charles Taylor, this, the, 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 the secular age. And that question I posed at the beginning about 500 years how things have changed. Well, these questions are being brought up now. Again, <coughs> maybe there is some extant manuscript that we don't know about. But this sort of dialogue didn't really exist in the same way it does today. It did. It was a plurality of opinion. And so Taylor tries to go back and say, what's the origin of this? And his opinion, and the same as my opinion, and I've written about it before, is this radically different concept of God, whereas in the world, uh, and the laws of the world emanate not from his intellect, but from his will. And this is the flaw of Occam. And God, the laws, God would not be totally free if he had to follow the laws in nature. God, by definition, has to be totally free. And so God being totally free, he can do whatever he wants. And so what you do, you open up in the past 500, 60 years, this possibility of a capricious God. A God who is governed by will alone. And so the possibilities of this, these different things that you describe become possible if you see, a, a, you, you're arguing for or looking at a concept of God where will is, has the primacy of rental. I don't buy that. I don't buy that. I think that God is totally free, but when he creates these rules, he creates these laws that would be moral or physical, then in no way, shape, or form constrains his freedom. Because freedom is not just the freedom to be in this and God be able to do whatever you want. And so there's got to be there's got to be a logic, there's got to be a set of, of rules of thinking, which is the principle of non contradiction or whatnot, that have to govern our ability to perceive reality. Otherwise, and I think that's the problem, there's there's so much atheism and doubt because of this, even though people realize it or don't realize it, there's predominantly in Western culture over the course of the past three or four years, this concept of God who's very capricious who's the God who wills wherever he wants and says, and that's why Descartes, I mean, Descartes was trained in nominalism. Descartes could say, you know, what if there was this evil God deceiving me? Um, who wants to live under this God? He could all of a sudden say to more that murder is all right or that gravity is, 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 is abolished. But if that's the concept of God primarily found in the will, then you can't, it's a cost problem. Uh, you know, our minds can't trust. I mean, you have to go back into history of philosophy which, of course, is, again, another discussion that I don't think is useful. I'll be interested in that discussion, but I don't, I don't think that uh, Descartes wanted to uh, uh, pursue a conception of God like that. He was stuck, though, saying he do things that are logically possible. It looks like a lot of these two crazy people. Yeah, but I mean, these I mean, are all more difficult. The last 500 years, I mean, the two well, stuff killed us. <laughs> that's well, uh, so we're around uh, to start talking. Well, well, I mean, that's got to be part of it, right? That's, that's why you get different points of view if you don't well, anyway, think we're depressed. Because actually, if you go back to the history of history, the uh, my opinion is that you're not going to read the sentence in the book. If you go back out to the vast majority of cultures believe in animism, you know, animal spirits, spirits of the lake, the moon, the sun, the god, uh, ghosts of their ancestors. And then they then they became polytheists, multi gods, the Greeks and the Roman gods, and eventually they became a single god, which is some religion that spread out into different monotheistic religions. So what would it take for you to say, you know, I'm wrong about my one particular version of monotheism, and I'm going to switch to polytheism or animism or some other uh, spiritual religion? I mean, I, I think for part of the reason that I believe in monotheism is because I believe in Revelation. I believe in that. Which I, I didn't really want to bring in too much into this discussion because of what we're trying to have with the philosophy club, not theology club. But <clears throat> I think that over the course of, of history and of time, that there's been, just like we have come with People used to think that, you know, uh, certain humors in the body led to different diseases, or certain spirits in the body led to different diseases. We understand better now that there's a different reason. I think that our, our, ability, our ability to perceive the world, to be able to think logically, to go beyond these animistic ways of perceiving things is part of the evolution of, of intelligence, to be able to say, 
there is a logical necessity for a, a monotheistic God. But even among monotheistic religions today, they still believe that each of their gods is exclusive to the other for the most part. I mean, in other words, that their is the one and only true religion, and the other gods are called gods for the most part. Well, so I mean, in other words, it depends on how you look. I mean, well, like, if there's one God, there's one God. Different religions have different concepts of God or what God is possible, but does it, and we could say, yes, those gods are not possible, but we would say, ultimately, they all, there's one God that everyone worships, even though you may have different concepts of God. But God in himself, there's certain qualities about him that are true or false. Either he's blue and has eight arms, or he is a non existent spirit, or he's a trinity of father, son, and spirit. I mean, they can't, in a certain sense, all be right. Well, but that's not that. So what would it take for you to say, gee, my own conception of monotheism is wrong? I mean, let me phrase it just differently. What would it take for you to say, you know what, there can't be, you know, the problem of evil, that there can't be either a perfectly all good being or perfectly uh, all good for me, For me personally? Oh, there, might be a, there might be a supreme God, but he's a little bit different. For, for me personally. Yeah, I, I would say for me personally, the thing that would set me on the way, I don't have to think about the question more, set me on the way is that I would stop believing the resurrection. I was so no amount of, of evil in the world, suffering, natural disaster, comic comics of all the earth, that human beings had nothing to do with, no amount of evil suffering would be used to say it. so far. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought about it a lot. I mean, I, mean I, 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 I was in Haiti. I mean, I've seen a lot of evil in my life. I'm a priest. I get to travel all the time. <laughs> oh, that was a really good day you have. I've seen a lot of evil. I've seen a lot of stuff. And believe me, I mean, there have been times that say, why would God permit this? How would God allow this? And that's the thing that they is, you know, the perhaps. I mean, I cannot give you scientific certitude that God exists. But God is not an object of the scientific method. But I've seen a lot of that, but what it does, and why some people may be prefer, prefer the not believe in it, I still do believe in there's a God. And for me as a Christian, really from anchoring, as much as I can, again, these arguments of contingency and I think the legitimacy of Aquinas in five ways, the crucifixion of the Christian perspective changes it. God, and again, from, I guess from your perspective, I mean, how would you see, I know we need to open this up for discussion here, how would you envision the Christian God who allows, let's presume we take all the Christian mythology, that allows the Son to come, in order to redeem man, because he could have done it certainly a different way. Well, that I want my Son to go and die this horrible death. Would you conceive that as an evil God? Um, that's, <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. It's so bizarre. I mean, why would you say, okay, you guys... You know, you kind of screwed this up, so I'm going to kill my kid. And in the process, you're going to come to know me better. And uh, meanwhile, Abraham, uh, you're going to kill your kid too. But, but in the process, you realize I'm such a great being. Is it possible? You know, is it possible? Is it logically? Can you tell a logically consistent story there? Sure, it's possible in that sense. Does it really? Is it really in any sense probable as far as I can tell? Does it make sense? In some intuitive way, it seems to me no. Okay, okay. It's, just, it's just like, wow, it, what, it, what, what are you it, thinking? It, this is not it, how you want exactly, to Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But, but the thing, no, I agree that yeah. according to common logic, it does not make sense. I was God, I would have destroyed him that day a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is that's what I was trying to say to the C.S. Lewis argument. It would seem too logical that our concept of God was made by us. But by the Christian perspective, that there's this God, it seems that kind of there's this in the Son who willfully chooses to die in order to redeem man or to solve the problem of evil, not by abolishing evil, but by transforming it from within. So that we accept evil, we take evil. And again, the, the odd logic that we should sit back and just let evil happen. No, that's not the way it works at all. Why does he permit it? That's the difference between God's permissible and actual. We have a responsibility to go out like Mother Teresa or whoever else you want to try to alleviate this evil. Um, How do we know that? Because, because we can't know what God really we can wants. A, we can perceive what we, we can because we can see we can perceive a moral law. We can perceive okay. structure in the universe. So yeah, I mean we can keep going on. Do you want to keep going on or do you want to open it up? Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. So questions from the audience. Um, do you want to pick up here? Okay. Uh, uh, this is about one, 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 one Marcus, principal of philosophy club, is going to keep an eye on um, who's got the guy that and stuff.
I think we have to stick with making common sense moral judgments, which includes going in there and saying, this thing that happened in Haiti was a bad thing, and we should try to uh, eliminate as much of that bad as possible, right? If we do that, then we're recognizing that something is evil there, right? If we have that ability, we can recognize that likely this evil was a pointless evil, otherwise we shouldn't be stopping it to begin with. So the claim is we have knowledge of pointless evils. That's all I'm trying to do.